Hi everyone, it's Kelly here. If this is your first time visiting my channel, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. Lovely to have you either way. Uh, today I am making a video that I, it was a, very much a whim. So I was um, doing a bit of reorganization of some of my books shelves. If you've been on this channel before, you will know that in this house we have many, many, many bookshelves. So um, I like to kind of change things up uh, just to kind of cycle things through and I have this one um, cabinet that I keep some of my classics in but I in my head it's always been the um, books that I'm kind of holding on to because they're ones I might recommend to someone or that I might read again um, but when I looked in that cupboard that actually wasn't the case there were quite a lot of books in there um, that actually I haven't read before uh, and I have had them for such a long time that I can't actually remember why I got them um, or where, what the what the plot is. So what I thought I'd do, and this is a bit of an experiment, I've also got lunch on the way um, being delivered, so at some point that may happen <laughs> um, while I'm filming, that's okay. Um, but what I thought I might do is go through this stack of books that I've got. Some of these are quite chunky, and at this point in my reading career, um, I think I you know, there's no point spending time reading a book that isn't grabbing you, you know, there's so many books out there, so little time um, that, you know, I only want to embark on a book if it's for a reason or if the, the, if the it sounds really, really promising. Um, so that's what I'm going to do because most of these books I would say I acquired somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 years ago and they've just sort of followed me from house to house um, and I've put them into this cabinet obviously but I I genuinely can't remember why I purchased them in the first place. So I've got a tub here ready to put any that I'm going to get rid of um, and I'm when I say get rid of I will either donate them or I will keep them for swaps in um, little free libraries and things like that. I keep like to keep a box of books in my car just in case you never know when you're going to go past a little free library right? And I like to be able to exchange. So let's go through this set of books. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the synopsis. I'm going to plug it into the story graph and I'm going to have a look at what the rating is. Um, and then I'm going to decide. So I've got my tablet ready um, to do that. So the first book is uh, Salmon Fishing in the Yemen by Paul Torday. Um, now let's have a look at this uh, synopsis. I've actually seen the film of this one, so I do vaguely remember what this is about, just from the film, not from the book, because I've never read that before. So it says, what does it take to make us believe in the impossible? For Dr. Alfred Jones, life is a quiet mixture of civil service at the National Centre for Fisheries Excellence and marriage to Mary, an ambitious, no-nonsense financier. But a strange turn of fate from an unexpected direction forces Jones to upend his existence and pursue another man's ludicrous dream. Is salmon fishing in the Yemen impossible? Maybe nothing is. It's not 100% grabbing me at the moment. So let's plug it in to, just going to put in salmon fishing. Surely that's going to come up. There we go. Okay. So slow paced, funny, lighthearted, relaxing, slow paced, 329 pages. Let's just check what it's overall. Whoa. Okay. So one of my friends on the story graph has rated this one star. Um, it's got an average rating of 3.37. I think I think we'll we'll let that one go. We'll let that one go. That's a good start. We're going to get rid of some books today. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is three cups of tea. Um, one man's mission to promote peace, one school at a time, uh, by Greg Mortensen and David Oliver Relin. Is this nonfiction? Oh. <laughs> Um, okay, my name is not Elaine, but this still has, oh, there's a, sorry, just so you know, there's a cat right behind the camera, <laughs> so that's what you just saw there. Uh, she thought I was giving it to her. My name is not Elaine, uh, and this bookmark is inside this book, so, and I've never even noticed that before. 
so if your name is Elaine and you would like a bookmark, hit me up. I've got one. Okay, so here we say, here in Pakistan and Afghanistan, we drink three cups of tea to do business. The first, you are a stranger. The second, you become a friend. And the third, you join our family. And for our family, we are prepared to do anything, even die. Which is a quote from Haji Ali, Kofi village chief from Karkaram Mountains, Pakistan. So the astonishing, uplifting story of a real life Indiana Jones and his remarkable humanitarian humanitarian campaign in the Taliban's backyard. Yeah, it's said, so this happens in 1993. This is some time ago. In 1993, a mountaineer named Greg Mortens, Mortensen drifted into an impoverished Pakistan village in the Karkaram Mountains after a failed attempt to climb K2. Moved by the inhabitants' kindness, he promised to return and build a school. Three Cups of Tea is the story of that promise and its extraordinary outcome. Over the next decade, Mortensen built not just one, but 55 schools, especially for girls in the forbidding terrain that gave birth to the Taliban. His story is at once a riveting adventure and a testament to the power of the humanitarian spirit. When was this actually published? Um, so it was published in 2006. Okay, so let's look it up. Okay, so uh, in terms of my friends' ratings of this book, we've got somebody who's given it a five and someone that's given it a three. So um, let's look at the information tagged. Informative, inspiring, slow-paced. I'm not a fan of a slow-paced book, but sometimes my idea of slow-paced, I've had other people, I would rate, things that other people have said are slow-paced, I would rate as medium-paced. So that's not always a, a complete turn off. 349 pages published, 2006. Average rating, 3.31. I mean, I'm sure that this guy did great things, but I don't actually think I want to read the book. I don't think I want to read the book. So it's going. Goodbye. All right, moving on. <laughs> the next one is called Cassandra, and it is by Kerry Greenwood, who I think is an Australian author. Okay. So this was published in 1995. It's quite an old book. On Mount Olympus, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, yawned. Even perfection can become tedious. My lord, she called to Apollo, sun god and brother, let us play a game with mortals, my power against yours. And so Cassandra, the golden-haired princess, cursed with the gift of prophecy, and Diomenes, the Achaean with the healing hands, become puppets of the gods. Their passions are thwarted, their loves betrayed, their gifts rendered useless for the sake of a wager between the immortals. Doomed, magnificent Troy is the stage. Cassandra and Diomenes, the leading players in this compelling story of the city's fall, both have found love before and lost it. Will they find each other in the light of the burning city? And if they do, can their love survive the machinations of malicious gods and men? Okay, that that actually sounds quite intriguing. So let's see. Cassandra, I'm feeling like there's going to be quite a lot of books called Cassandra. So I'm going to put um, the author's surname in as well. Okay, medium paced. Uh, so fiction, historical, mystery, adventurous, mysterious, medium paced. Okay, okay, okay. 395 pages. It's not crazy. Average rating is 3.88. No, none of my friends have read this book, but it's an older one. So that's not super surprising. Okay, I think I'm actually going to keep this one and give it a try. Maybe give it a couple of chapters and um, see if it draws me in and if so then I will keep it and continue reading all right next one is The Various by Steve Orgard and I'm probably I'm pretty certain that the main reason I've picked this up is because it has um silver foil <laughs> um I mean the, yeah and it's a cool cover that's probably the reason I've picked this up all right so it says okay it's the winner of the Smarties Bronze Award which I don't know what that is uh, yeah, looks like it was published in the UK, so maybe that's a UK um, award. There have been stories of the little people, pixies, fairies, call them what you will, ever since the world began. 
Whispered rumours are all they amount to until a 12-year-old child discovers the truth. Hidden away among briars and brambles, the truth is strange and wild and sometimes deadly. A compelling tale of the extraordinary tribes who struggle for survival in the land of human giants. You may even be tempted to seek them out for yourself. Okay, um, it's also got a... Um, I'm not going to read out all of the quotes that are below, but it is calling it a children's classic. It's quite long for a book for kids. How many pages is this? 448 pages. Wowzers. The writing's not that tiny. Oh, I, again, book, uh, a bookmark. That could possibly have been me trying uh, picking up and then, and then not and not keeping on reading so this was originally published in 2003 okay let's look it up okay so also this is part of a trilogy it seems okay so it's a yeah definitely children's fantasy and then it's also got a young adult tag so I can't decide if it's a children's book or a young adult book, but that's okay. Adventurous, slow-paced. Okay. Uh, so none of my friends... Oh, no, sorry. One person has interacted with it. What does that mean? So it's been read, but they haven't given it a rating or um, anything like that. Average rating 3.68. Okay, I'm going to have a quick look here at the description because it's just got a short one here, um, which to me looks more like what it's about. Rather, this is just trying to be like intriguing. Um, so it says, abandoned with her eccentric uncle during the holidays, Midge discovers a band of earthly realistic fairies. They are strange, wild, and sometimes even deadly and have been a secret since the beginning of time. But clashing with humans, they are now under threat. Okay, I think I'm going to give this one a miss. I don't, I'm not feeling super compelled to read it. The cover is beautiful though. Someone else will enjoy that more than I will, I'm sure. Okay, let's move on to the next one. It is The Gypsy Tea Room by Nikki Pellegrino. Uh, Beauty in a Bride Attracts suspicious, Suspicion in a Widow. Okay. Uh, well, this was obviously purchased a long time ago. Look how expensive it was. I don't think I've seen a paperback book cost that much for some time in Australia. In Australia, our books used to be super, super expensive. So that's why I did so much thrifting. I still just love thrifting though. Okay, so it says, This is the story of Raffaella Moretti, by far the most beautiful girl in the southern Italian town of Triento, who was about to marry the only boy she has ever loved. It seems that nothing but happiness lies in store for Raffaella. So the last thing she expects is to find herself a widow one short year later, down on her hands and knees, scrubbing clean the layers of dirt from a strange house. As Raffaella struggles to recapture her own lost happiness, she starts looking for ways to help those around her do the same. As the lives of the villagers interweave, Raffaella is pulled into the centre of a conflict that threatens not only to divide Triento, but also to in no I've lost my place. Also to destroy all she holds dear. Filled with food, feuds, love and longing reading Reading The Gypsy Tea Room is like taking a seat in the Piazza of Triento, somewhere between the bustle of the market stalls and the sweetly scented bakery and becoming a tiny part of the endless spectacle of life there. Okay. That would be how much I, sp I paid for this. Four bucks. Okay. So this was published in 2007. Um... Also, just while I'm typing this in, I am aware that we don't use the term gypsy anymore. Um, so no offense is intended. That is just what the book is called. Okay. Ooh, slow pace. Not a good start. Already I'm not feeling super compelled by, um, by that. Okay, only nine people have given this a rating and it's got an average rating of 3.67. Emotional, reflective slow paced. I do normally like emotional and reflective books, but slow paced and I'm not so feeling super drawn to this story. So I think I, again, oh, that is one of my photos. It's 
So clearly I did start reading this and then I've put it down. Um, yeah. Nah. He's gone. Okay, moving on. All right, the next one is Teacher Man by Frank McCourt, um, who is the best-selling author of Angela's Ashes. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, I am a teacher, so that's probably the reason that I've picked this up. This memoir, I actually remember, I actually remember buying this. I bought this um, at a Vinnie's that was near my old work. I do remember picking this up in the Vinnie's. With the wit, charm, and poignancy that made Angela's Ashes and Tiz so universally beloved, and Frank McCourt tells his most exhilarating story yet, how he first became a teacher and then a writer. In Teacher Man, Frank turns his attention to subjects clo closest to his heart. Teaching, why it's so important. My cat is scratching at the books. Can you stop that, please? Rude. Okay. So... Uh, teaching why it's so important, why it is so undervalued, and storytelling. He tells of his own coming of age as a teacher, a storyteller, and ultimately a writer. Alternate, alternately humble and mischievous, downtrodden and rebellious, he instinctively identifies with the underdog. From every one of these captivating pages, it is clear that from the very start he seized his students' attention by telling great stories, and he, here he does it again for us. Okay. So, again, I paid $4 for that one. <laughs> There's a, a photo, which I'm assuming is of him. It's very odd. It's where he's got a plastic bag on his head. Very strange man. Okay, so this was first published in 2005. Let's pop it in. I don't read a whole lot of um, biographies, so... Okay, 258 pages, so it's under 300 pages, which is a good start. Again, slow pace, though. Emotional, inspiring, <laughs> reflective. I'm not a massive um, reader of an inspiring, inspiring book. Um, okay, so none of my friends have interacted with this book. Average rating, 3.7. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe what I'll do is I will do the same as I said with Cassandra and just hold on to it um, just to read maybe a little bit of it and then come back and check. All right, the next one is actually a hardcover, um, cloth-bound cloth hardcover book. Um, it's called The Ladies of Grace Adieu and Other Stories by Susanna Clark, author of best-selling Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Magic, madam, is like wine, and if you are not used to it, it will make you drunk. Uh, that's not really telling me much, and I, this doesn't have its slip cover anymore. I think that's the way I bought it. It was published in 2006. It doesn't look super long, which I know um, the Strange story, what's it called, the Strange? Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell is a really, really long book. Um, 235 pages, so that's quite short, but it's also, I believe, short stories, so let's have a look. We'll have to look that one up to even get the synopsis. Adventurous, slow-paced. How can a short story collection be slow-paced? Very strange. Okay. Okay, so this is actually from the world of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. Fairy is never as far away as you think. Sometimes you can find you have crossed an invisible line and must cope as best you can with petulant princesses, vengeful owls, ladies who pass their time embroidering terrible fates or with endless paths in deep, dark woods and houses that never appear the same way twice. The heroines and heroes bedeviled by such problems in these fairy tales include a conceited Regency clergyman, an 18th century Jewish doctor, and Mary, Squeen of, Squeen of, Co of Cots, Squeen of Cots, Queen of Scots, as well as two characters from the Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell from that book, Strange himself and the Raven King. I actually haven't read that book. The Ladies of Grace of Dew is the perfect introduction to a world where charm is always tempered by eeriness and Picaresque, I think that's supposed to say picturesque, picturesque, picaresque, is that a word? Maybe it is. Comedy is always darkened by the disturbing shadow of fairy. Okay, so two people 
who I follow have both rated this book four stars. So that's a good start. Average rating 3.88. Okay. I don't know whether I should should read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell first before I read this. Um, hmm. I'll hold on to it just for now um, and maybe come back to it at a later point, I think. Okay, the next one is called The Lost Book of Salem by Catherine Howe. Um, this one is a chunky one. And for a bookmark, we've got in here an old bank. Oh, no, this is from Vinnie's. Let's see what the date is so that we can see how long ago this was acquired. Um, okay, well, all I can say is that the expiry date on the card that was used to purchase it was 2014. So that's a long time ago. I cannot see the date. Oh, it's because it's faded. 2012, it looks like. 26th of April, 2012. I've had this book for a long time. The Lost Book of Salem. Okay, let's have a look. A fresh present day story infused with an original take on popular history. Forget broomsticks and pointy hats. Here are witches that could well be walking among us today. This debut novel flows with poetic charm and eloquence that achieves high lit literary merit while concocting a gripping supernatural puzzler. Catherine Howe's talent is spellbinding. Okay, but that doesn't tell me anything about the book. Oh, here we go. Uh, right. A spellbindingly... No, a spellbinding, beautifully written novel that moves between contemporary times and one of the most fascinating and disturbing periods in American history, the Salem Witch Trials. Harvard graduate student Connie Goodwin needs to spend her summer doing research for her doctoral dissertation. But when her mother asks her to handle the, the sale of Connie's grandmother's abandoned home near Salem, she can't refuse. As she is drawn deeper into the mysteries of the family house, Connie discovers an ancient key within a 17th century Bible. The key, sorry, I'm getting distracted because I've got a cat. <laughs> okay, the key the, contains a yellowing fragment of parchment with a name written upon it, Deliverance Dane. This discovery launches Connie on a quest to find out who this woman was and to unearth a rare artifact of singular power, a physic book. Physic is spelt P-H-Y-S-I-C-K. Its pages, a secret repository for the lost knowledge. As the pieces of Deliverance's harrowing story begin to fall into place, Connie is haunted by visions of the long, long ago witch trials, and she begins to fear that she is more tied to Salem's dark past than she could have ever imagined. Written with astonishing conviction and grace, The Lost Book of Salem um, travels seamlessly between the witch trials of the 1690s and a modern woman's story of mystery, intrigue and revelation. Okay, that does sound somewhat intriguing. This was published in... 2009 okay let's look it up okay so this is looks to be a part of a series this is book one of a series um mysterious slow paced oh. <laughs> not a good start okay let's see um 467 pages Ooh. average rating 3.54 I mean, for for a rating that's that low, I mean, not that three three point five is a fine rating, but it's just this is a long book to read for what might only be kind of mediocre. I mean, the cover does look really cool, but that's not good enough reason to to read it. I think we're gonna pass that one on. All right, let's move on. This one is called The Owl Killers by Karen Maitland. Um, and again, we've got some gorgeous silver foil there. No price written inside. Uh, published in 2009. Okay. 
Deep in the heart, oh sorry, England, 1321, welcome to the dark ages. Deep in the heart of the countryside lies an isolated village governed by a sinister regime of owl masters. Theirs is a pagan world of terror and blackmail, where neighbour denounces neighbour and sin is punishable by murder. This dark status quo is disturbed by the arrival of a house of religious women who establish a community outside the village. Why do their crops succeed when the village crops fail? Their cattle survive despite the, the plague, but petty jealousy turns deadly when the women give refuge to a young martyr, for she dies a gruesome death after spitting the sacramental host after spitting the sacramental host into flames that can't burn it. What magic is this? Or is the martyr now a saint and the host a holy relic? Accusations of witchcraft and heresy run rife while the owl masters rain down hellfire and torment on the women who must look to their faith to save them from the lengthening shadow of evil, a shadow with pre predatory, terrifying talons. I mean, that is a pretty good blurb, let's be honest. Okay, the owl killers. Okay. All right, 640 pages. Oh, my gosh. It's better be worth it. All right. Medium paste. Good, good, good. Dark, mysterious, medium paste. Okay. None of my, my friends have read it. Okay. 3.73. And that's nearing a four. And given that that's going to be um, like an average, there'll be some people who've rated it probably heart much higher than that okay let's just have a look a bit more deeply because there's 204 reviews so that's a pretty decent amount everyone says it's dark everyone says it's mysterious everyone says it's tense 40 percent of people say sad 20 percent of people say emotional okay uh mix plot or character driven 50 percent of people say a mix 50 percent of people say character so that's interesting okay strong character development yes 66 percent it's complicated 33 percent lovable characters 66 percent say yes 33 percent say no i wonder if they're the same people um diverse cast of characters yes 66 percent it's complicated 33 percent at flaws of characters a main focus yes 66 percent it's complicated 33 percent Ooh, okay, that's hard to decide, actually. But I was quite intrigued by, by the synopsis of this one, the blurb on the back. So I think, again, we might give this one a go and see where that takes us. Okay, only two more to go. Let's go. The Sixth Lamentation by William Broderick. Um, if you can't quite tell, those are, looks like they're all candles. Some of them out, one of them still going. Larkwood Priory, Suffolk. It's following, it is following his afternoon confessions that Father Anselm is stopped by an old man in the nave. What, he is asked, should a man do when the world has turned against him? Anselm's response to claim sanctuary is to have greater resonance than he could ever have imagined. For that evening, the old man returns, demanding the protection of the church. His name is Ed, Edvard, Edward? Schwerman, and he is wanted by the police as a, a suspected war criminal. With her life running out, Agnes Aubrey feels it is time to unburden her to her granddaughter Lucy the secret she has been carrying for so long. Fifty years earlier, Agnes had been living in occupied Paris, a member of a small group risking their lives to smuggle Jewish children to safety until they were exposed by a young SS officer, Ed Edward Schwerman. But as Father Anselm discovers, history is more slippery, more complicated than it first appears. For not only has the church given Schwerman sanctuary before, in 1944 it helped him escape from France and begin a new life in Britain. As Anselm attempts to find out why, and as Lucy's search into her grandmother's past continues, their investigations dovetail to reveal a remarkable story. Okay, that does sound interesting. Okay, let's see what it has to say. Father Anselm Mysteries number one. So again, this is part of a series. 400 pages, first published in 1999. Mysterious, slow paced. Mm. Okay, nobody I've read, I uh, follow has read it. 3.71 is the average rating. 
but only 21 reviews. Hmm. I mean, it does sound somewhat um, interesting. But I just feel like it's one of those things where I might... It doesn't sound interesting enough to me um, for me to get to it, probably. So we're going to pass that one on to someone who's going to enjoy it more than I. All right, the last one. This is Picture Maker by Panina Spinker. Uh, an extraordinary novel of an exotic world. Okay, let's find out about it. The world of 14th century America is unknown to most readers and Panina Spinker's remarkable novel brings it triumphantly alive from tribal wars through to the Norse invasions. The girl known as Picture Maker because of her great great ability at drawing and prophecy is the daughter of one of the warriors and gr the granddaughter of the clan leader. Captured by one of her family's enemies, she is kept as a trophy and enslaved. Hmm. She manages to escape, and even though alone and pregnant, she is driven to find the place and people prophesied for her. Picture Maker is a powerful story in a fascinating setting which will appeal to readers of Jean All and Jane Smiley, two authors I've never heard of. Panina Spinker has created a large cast of vivid characters, particularly rich is Picture Maker herself as she grows beyond her once narrow conf confines, an amazing and very human survivor. Okay. I paid $6 for this one. Uh, so this was published in 2002. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Okay, so this is the Norse forward slash Mohawk trilogy, number one. 464 pages, first published 2002. Adventurous, slow-paced. Mm, it's not looking good for this one, guys. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. Oh, it's a clan of women. Did I read that in this? No. Why would they not put that in the blurb? Okay, interesting, because that changes things. Oh, and it's got an average rating of 4.31, but only 13 ratings. Okay, so let's just see what more I can gather. I won't read the whole thing out from here. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so picture make her journey doesn't end when she finds this other group of people that she, that was referred to. Picture makers travels take her across North America and into the distant corners of the Western Hemisphere, where she ultimately meets Halvard, a Norse hunter who holds the key to the riddle of her birth. Together they sail to Greenland, where Halvard's way of life comes under attack, and Picture Maker is shunned as an outcast for her special gifts. Her fate becomes her fate comes full circle as she struggles to save her young daughter from being taken from her as she was long ago torn from her own clan. So it's a, a bit of a saga, it seems, and okay. Ooh. Historical fiction. Not generally a period that I tend to read a lot though. The 1400s. I don't know. I don't know about this one. We might have to actually read a little bit more. Oh, there's a map. We do like we do like a map. No. You know what? I'm not gonna read. It's I'm just never gonna pick it up. I know that. Um because it's it's got some things going against it that are like things that I would make me not pick it up. And given that like no one I've I'm following has interacted with it, published in 2002, I think we're going to give it a miss, guys. It's a bit sad to to be passing these books on, but also quite happy because if I'm going to be exchanging these for books in little free libraries, then I'm going to be getting books that are of interest to me. Um and of those books, however many there were, I'm keeping four. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Here they are. So they're the four that I'm going to be keeping um, for now, at least. The Ladies of Grace Adieu, 
uh, Teacher Man, Cassandra and the Owl Killers. So that has very much helped me to um, cut down on these books that were have been in storage for a long time that I haven't picked up um, and to help me find the ones that I will quite possibly want to pick up in the future. So thank you for um, going along with me today. It's a bit of an odd video that I, I don't normally do but I just thought it might be fun. So I hope you've had some fun and I will see you on the next one. Bye guys!